final session for the day. Uh, for those of you who uh, don't know me, and I want to thank all of you who have uh, stayed here to the bitter end to, uh, for the uh, last session of the day. It certainly is very indicative of your commitment to professional ethics and to the protection of research subjects, and for that we're grateful. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Commander Charles English. I uh, am the Navy Bureau of Medicine and Surgery's Research and Development Liaison Officer at uh, the uh, Office of the Director of Defense Research and Engineering and also in the Office of the uh, Chief of Naval Operations in the Pentagon. I uh, work with, uh, very closely with, uh, Dr. Anna johnson Winnegar in uh, ddr &E. She is the Director of Environmental and Life Sciences and also with the uh, subject matter experts on human subject protection from the uh, three services and the Uniformed Services University of the Health Sciences. Our uh, topic today, uh, IRBs and the uh, TRICARE era, I think begs uh, in the first uh, place we need a definition of just what TRICARE is. Well, TRICARE, I think quite simply put, is uh, the Department of Defense and the Military Services uh, health care benefit for the foreseeable future. It is in effect a, uh, a managed form of health care delivery and it was brought about uh, quite simply by an era of diminishing resources and the need uh, for the department to have a viable system, a viable and robust system uh, for delivering health care to the beneficiaries of the Department of Defense as well as maintain the primary mission of uh, the uh, medical service in the uh, military which is of course delivering health care to the operational force in the battlefield should that uh, occasion arise. From my perspective, I don't believe that we're going to see a whole lot of difference in the uh, way that IRBs <coughs> operate in the military, either in the military hospitals or in our biomedical research and development uh, laboratories, as a direct result of the implementation of TRICARE. However, having said that, I think that there are uh, certain activities that are ongoing uh, within the era of TRICARE, which is upon us now and will be with us for the foreseeable future, which are going to bear and have an impact upon the way that IRBs do, uh, do their business on a day-to-day -day basis. Not the least of these, from my perspective, are certain regulatory changes which are upon us. As most of you in this room are aware, the uh, Department of Defense is poised to promulgate a, a new directive on protection of human subjects later this summer. So that is one change that certainly will impact on the way that IRBs do their business in both the clinical uh, side of the house as well as in the biomedical research and development side of the house. Another uh, regulatory affair that is going on now is in the Congress of the United States. As many of you know, Senator Glenn has introduced uh, Senate Bill 193, which is entitled the Protection of Human Research Subjects Act of 1997. If enacted into law, this would in effect convert the uh, current uh, common rule, as we've come to know it, uh, the uh, Code of Federal Regulations for not only the Department of Defense but all of the federal government into statutory law. Certainly this would have some impact upon the way that the uh, IRBs do business. Also we have the President's National Bioethics Advisory Commission. This commission has divided itself into two subcommittees. One of the subcommittees is dealing with uh, issues dealing particularly with protections of human subjects within the federal government and especially are the current protections afforded by the federal system sufficient in and of themselves or do they need improvement and if improvements are needed what should those be? The uh, NBAC subcommittee will in turn report to the full NBAC and then at some point in the future we believe the uh, NBAC will render a report to the president uh, and probably will make recommendations across the federal government dealing with uh, what they think ought to be done to improve our current system. So certainly, whatever recommendations the NBAC makes will have uh, an influence on how our IRBs, both within the military and throughout the country, will, uh, will do their business. Joining me on the panel today, we have uh, Lieutenant Colonel Meade Pemsler. Dr. Pemsler is the, uh, currently the uh, director uh, the Clinical and Biomedical Research and Development uh, Division in the Office of the Air Force Medical Operating Agency for the Air Force Surgeon General. On my left is Major Dale Vanderham, who is the head of the Human uh, Use Research and Regulatory Affairs Division at the uh, U.S. Army's Medical Research and Materiel Command in Fort Detrick, Maryland. 
And to get things started, I would just like to uh, say that we would, uh, since this is the last session of the day, I think it's appropriate that uh, we sort of run this. Uh, for those of you who are veterans of the arena and the, and the preminar meetings, uh, as I know many of you are, this will be our curbstone session for the day. We're going to throw out some topics that hopefully will be of interest to you, that hopefully will have some bearing on the way that IRBs will conduct their business in the TRICARE era. And we would like to encourage, and we uh, strongly encourage your interaction with us. I know that we have some of the other subject matter experts from the services and from the university in the audience. So please, as the topics are thrown out, uh, grab the microphones, jump right in, and let's make this an interactive session. So I'd like to first uh, ask uh, Colonel Pemsler if he would like to uh, toss out a, uh, an idea, a notion, an issue, if you will, that he thinks may be of, uh, have an impact on IRBs in the TRICARE era. Well, I have, uh, I have two things, uh, notional things to throw out. The first is that in the TRICARE era, we're going to see greater and greater integration of graduate medical education, sharing of medical faculties, distribution of medical services across physical facilities, within services and across services. And one of the things which is going to happen as a result of this is studies will want to move between facilities and across services within a TRICARE region, for example. There is presently no expeditious mechanism whereby to avoid duplication of effort inherent in these moves. For example, I could envision a study being simultaneously monitored by five different IRBs, each of which imposed their own unique spin, personality driven perhaps, uh, sometimes substantive, on the way the study looked, what the analysis was like, what the informed consent document actually said, that uh, the investigator is going to have to provide five different progress reports, and uh, it's going to be very messy. I think that uh, it behooves us all to examine uh, ex how can we facilitate research, still protect the human subjects, and yet reduce the what could become a really overwhelming bur administrative burden. That's the first thing. Uh, I don't really know how to, how to go about doing that, though, I'll be honest with you. The next question uh, really doesn't have to do with IRBs so much as it has to do with the fate of research uh, in a managed care environment in which business case analysis drives all decisions. Um, in the civilian sector, I'm not talking the military sector now, but in the civilian sector, it is estimated that a research institution spends 10 to 15 percent more on patient care than a non-research institution caring for patients with the same acuity, same demographics, and so on. The fact is, it is expensive to do research. Um, in the military setting, I can give you an example of how this might work out, uh, because, but I don't have numbers, so I don't want, to, don't, don't want you to stick with this 10 percent uh, business. That's just for civilian uh, institutions. But for example, at uh, Misawa Air Base in Japan, primarily a family practice community hospital setting. The providers see between 20 and 25 patients a day, every day, every single provider. At David Grant Medical Center, which is a very large and I think very good regional medical center in the Air Force, uh, the average provider sees eight patients per day. This is attributed to, or it was a couple of years ago, attributed to the requirements for a teaching hospital in-depth uh, in depth review of cases, discussion of the literature, and so on. I'm not saying that it's, this is invalid. I'm simply saying that here's a productivity cost to being involved in a teaching institution. I think as we move into TRICARE and the dollars disappear and we have to defend everything we do based on business case and in direct competition with a civilian provider network, aimed at capturing those billions of defense dollars going into the uh, health ben benefit, we're going to have to come up with some really, really good justifications for paying this overhead. And does that mean that we should target research? Does that mean that we should have some sort of product which has a bottom line value? Should we start thinking in terms of if this 
what are the implications of this research in terms of the efficiency with which we provide care, uh, the outcome of care, uh, that sort of thing. I know that mostly we don't think in those terms right now, but perhaps we're going to have to. That is what we had hoped for. Uh, having dealt at the MAGCOM for about the last six years at two different MAGCOMs within the Air Force, I have to give a bureaucratic ease answer to that one. And that is that it's within your baseline, and so you better bet that you'll be responsible to continue to do that research. Otherwise, we'll simply take your extra manpower and your, and your money away, and we'll apply it someplace else where the research can be done or we just won't do it. Right. The, um, um, but but it is not within the realm of what you're allowed to decide locally at that point to decide to stop doing research and to do other things because it is within the, the baseline. So that's the bureaucratic answer to that one. May I respond? I'll respond. Okay. Oh, go ahead, ma'am. No, I was going to hit Please. the first one. Go ahead. Well, uh, if you look at the, the assertion that it's within the baseline, there is a certain amount of O&M dollars set aside to run research facilities. There are um, personnel assigned to support the research enterprise. However, um, the, dollars are in the dollars to actually support clinical research are undifferentiated. They are, in fact, DHP dollars. In many places, the spend spending that money for research versus patient care is entirely discretionary on the part of the hospital commander. Army and Navy, that's true. In the Air Force, we, we shave some off of the DHP before it's distributed to protect it in a certain uh, as much as we can, but that's no guarantee that we'll be able to do that in the future. So uh, I would say, yeah, it's in the baseline, but yeah, it's also not in the baseline. The other problem we have is a, is a sort of um, dynamic tension between what is envisioned to be the role of the TRICARE lead agent and the services, the MAGCOMs, and so on. The fact is that um, right now we don't really understand how this is going to work. The TRICARE executive, in order for this to work, has to control the funds, control the personnel, in order to make these CEO, CFO kind of decisions within his region. We have not, as a department, permitted that to happen. That is not to say that it is not going to happen. It may be a survival decision for us. So I would be less confident than you, than you are about the administrative longevity of a clinical research program in a tri-carrier. I'll comment on your first uh, issue in terms of tri-service uh, integration. And at Brook Army Medical Center and uh, Wilford Hall, we're probably the most integrated in terms of the Institutional Review Board and clinical investigation protocols. My first comment is that we in the military probably have one of the biggest opportunities in the country if we could come up with a unified protocol format and informed consent format, uh, then we could do multi-center studies across the three services looking at outcomes, which is, you know, the biggest area of research that's probably needed in the country in this time of managed care, to so look at outcome data. But in order to take advantage of that opportunity, we need to quickly uh, merge some of our ideas and form an even bigger integration. Uh, if we had a standard format that could be used across three services, one could then go through uh, an individual IRB in a certain area, like in the San Antonio area, which is integrated with two of the services, or perhaps in the Washington, D.C. area, if you were integrated with all three services. If you then wanted to expand to another location, at clinical centers within the military, you could ask for an expedited review at which they would know that you had gone through this military process in depth. You would then see if in your local area you were comfortable giving it an expedited approval uh, and then implement it at those institutions as well with new co-PIs. But I think that the stopgap measure right now is that we would need to adopt a tri-service uniform format and a uniform format for the consent document that everybody could live with. Now that takes some compromise, which is painful in the beginning, but I think John Cody from Wilford Hall and I are here to tell you it can be done and it can work. Uh, 
Um, my name is Major Vanderham, and I uh, am the Human Use Review Officer up at Fort Detrick. I work in the Office of the Deputy Chief of Staff for Regulatory Compliance and Quality. And along the tri-service <coughs> lines, I know of one agreement that does exist where we have a memorandum between the three Surgeon Generals, and that relates to HIV studies. The services agreed some years in the past that we would follow somewhat like the uh, oncology trials, and they would have one central IRB do a first cut on the protocols, and then they would be sent out to the local IRBs. And the local IRBs could make some minor modifications, but they couldn't make any, and the word quote is, any substantive changes to the science. Uh, and that was so that this data that was collected in the Tri-Service HIV program could be compared across the services. Um, I'm not saying that's the only model that worked fairly well when we had a lot of HIV protocols out there. The protocols would come into our office from the, uh, the different Tri-Service scientific review panels for the AIDS research. And our office would send it out to different offices, to the clinical, the, the Ciro office, down to Colonel Emile's office, over to um, uh, Mead Pimsler's office, and to the Navy uh, HIV reviewer. And they would do a, a review of the protocol before it ever went to, to our Surgeon General's HSRB. Our Surgeon General's HSRB, under this agreement, was, was to have two members from each of the other services, Army, Navy, and the Air Force, for six more augmentees to, at that time, do a, quote, tri-service first cut review at an, at, of an IRB of the protocol. Um, normally, the way that worked, uh, we did get all the administrative reviews back from the services. They did get their comments. It would go to, their, to the IRB, and we would have one member from the services show up. And that creates a little bit of an imbalance. Uh, Colonel Pimser and I were talking uh, earlier, I think it was Monday of this week, about if you're really going to have a tri-service board, we probably ought to have six or eight members and work it out that you have you know, two or three people from each service and not have 16 members from the Army one member from the Air Force and one member from the Navy. Um, in the future, as we start going towards downsizing more and more after the quadrennial review, uh, we may want to look at a model like the Tri-Service HIV program, not to say that you need to use the Army. We could use uh, USIS or we could go to DDRNE and establish a Tri-Service uh, central IRB and put two to three members from each of the services to include USIS. If you want to do eight members, that's two from each. And have a central review of some of these protocols that are going to be multi-center, multi-service protocols. Come up with some type of an agreement and work that into the process along with developing uh, the new DOD Directive 3216. Not to hold up that directive for this at the moment, because we need to put that out for other reasons. But incorporate that as, as we move towards a common consent and a common protocol form. Then, following the same mode, that could go down to the, to the services and they could make changes that aren't substantive changes. Uh, but I would remind everybody, that we do have calls frequently on and off over the years, how can we do this to avoid going to the local IRB? Under all the current regulations, the local IRB has a final say no matter what. Every local institution has a slightly different population. If you're doing uh, a study in San Antonio, Texas, you may have a more Hispanic population. You may have a different population of troops. You may have a different population of family members than you would have if you were at a Navy site in, in New York State or at an infantry site, uh, 82nd Airborne in Fort Bragg, North Carolina. Populations differ, and that's one of the reasons we have local IRBs. So even if you do institute um, some commonality. Uh, we got to remember the, the IRB, in conjunction with that commander, has a final say on what's going to take place at that institution. Yeah, I would agree that the uh, IRB, the local IRB, is the cornerstone not only of our uh, system of protection of subjects in the military and the DOD, but is in fact the cornerstone of the entire federal system for protection of human subjects. And if uh, Senator Glenn's legislation, in fact, becomes law, then that practice will be extended to cover not only research in the federal domain, but all research conducted involving human subjects anywhere in this country. 
which uh, brings to issue, uh, it's, it's one thing to develop a, a standardized protocol. Uh, I doubt very seriously if anyone's ever going to come up with a totally standardized consent form. I haven't even seen a standardized consent form that worked in a single laboratory environment, in my experience. But given the fact that the local IRB is the, uh, the cornerstone, is it in fact going to be possible for us to, to develop a totally integrated system like that and still maintain local control as the principal guiding uh, factor, the dominant factor in protection of human subjects? Well, uh, it, has it, if people recall uh, Captain Freeman's, uh, Freeman's discussion of how the Indian Health Service works, um, you may have mentioned, you may recall that he was talking about our IRB. I had occasion at lunchtime to ask him, what does that mean? Does that mean you only have one, S sort of for the whole country? And the answer was no, but, but they have adopted a system whereby they have a limited number of regions. And each IR, and there is an IRB for each region, which, which uh, satisfies OPRR, apparently. Uh, as providing the local consent, the local perspective. And perhaps what we need to think about in the TRICARE era is a, a way for us to, uh, to arrive at some sort of limited number of regional IRBs which would satisfy the intent um, of the regulation and yet not require and not, but yet not require proliferation of IRBs all over the place. And by the way, it would also allow us to have greater depth on those regional IRBs with regard to scientific expertise um, and so on. It would solve some of the problems that IRBs at smaller institutions are plagued with today. Yes, sir. Comment up here. Yes, this, this question is a little bit of uh, mixing apples and oranges, but uh, do you anticipate any impact of availability of referred patients for studies that, re that revised, revised financing will have on uh, R&D. You know, uh, fairly soon uh, there will be revised financing, i.e. the uh, MTF commander will be controlling the funds for those people in this catchment area, which includes Champus dollars as well. And some of the money for patient referrals, transfer and so forth, uh, come out of their O&M budget. Now, one might anticipate that could have a potential impact on availability of patients for research. I don't know. But I'm asking the question to see if it's been, if it's been considered. Uh, do you have any, any answer at all? Well, let me first of all throw up my hands and say that I don't make a policy, uh, nor, do I, nor have I played significantly in the design of the healthcare delivery system. My role is sort of, sort of limited, okay? So uh, whatever I say, please don't tell General Roadman that, that this is the, what, what the Air Force thinks because I can only tell you what my perspective on this is. And my perspective is that we have not worked out in a reasonable way as yet exactly how um, coordination of services, provision of funds, uh, and patient um, movement within regions is actually going to occur. And that's because uh, the, the, there is a essential disconnect, sort of, between what we say the lead agent is supposed to do and the powers retained by the MAGCOMs, um, by the command surgeons, by the services over personnel, finance, and, and facilities. Well, this is, this is knocking on our door right now, and yeah. it probably deserves a whole lot of attention. I assure you, it's getting a great deal of attention. <laughs> question, and, question and a comment. Given the probable, relatively short-term report out by the NBAC, is there any thought to deferring the promulgation of the revised DOD instructions so that it'll incorporate whatever recommendations the president may uh, promulgate based upon the NBAC recommendations? And my comment is my perception is that a greater impact on clinical research and the purview of the IRBs of TRICARE is going to be that with outsourcing, 
it may be more difficult for the MTF researchers to acquire the N of subjects that they are seeking because patients that may presently be treated in-house under the new system may be triaged to uh, civilianized sources of participating management. And my thought would be that that may drive greater collaborations or a, an increased number of collaborations between the civilian and the military sector than even exist now to uh, potentially recruit those those subjects that otherwise would escape out of the uh, catchment of the uh, investigators. But if you, if you would address the question, uh, I'm curious how you're going to plan to respond to the NBAC recommendations vis-a-vis -vis the pending DOD instruction. Well, I think it depends entirely on when, uh, from our perspective, on when uh, NBAC actually renders a final report uh, with regard to protection of human research subjects issues. Certainly if it is going to be done in a in a timely manner, i.e. a rapid manner, which means you know, sometime by the end of the summer, early fall, then I think we would give consideration to uh, delaying the promulgation of the, uh, of the new DOD directive until we'd had a chance to see what the recommendations are. On the other hand, if it appears that uh, the report is not going to be forthcoming until uh, late into the year of this year, we would probably go ahead and promulgate the new directive and then study what the recommendations are and then uh, commence with revising the directive one more time. I understand that the, uh, the NBAC commission has been extended for two years. So I don't, I don't know if Dr. Childress is still in the room. We can ask him tomorrow. But I don't know if that puts off their requirement to do a report this year or if they, if they need an interim report or if it just puts it off for another two years. No, oh, I know their term has been extended for two years. I'm, uh, and if the uh, uh, legislation that was proposed uh, last week, week before last, I believe it was last week, to uh, implement uh, NBAC's recommendations regarding cloning, that would extend the uh, charter of the uh, NBAC for another three years beyond that because the, uh, the proposed uh, uh, grace period on uh, cloning, the ban on cloning, would be... Uh, for a five-year period, and then back then would be required to report to the president at the end of that period on what progress, what, a, uh, what the biethical considerations of uh, the next five years in the cloning world are going to be. So therefore, I think it's safe to assume the NBAC is going to be a, around for uh, at least another four or five years. I uh, don't know whether or not that is going to uh, directly impact the timeline which they had uh, decided upon before they were uh, given this new extension on their uh, new lease on life, as it were. I would like to ask uh, if anyone in the audience has an opinion on whether or not IRB reciprocity, if such a thing were to exist within the services, within the DOD structure, how would this impact upon the uh, command requirement of the facility commander? because in our DOD facilities, the uh, facility commander is the one who has the final approval authority. He cannot overrule an IRB's decision not to approve, but he can certainly contramand an IRB decision to go ahead with approval. If you had IRB reciprocity and you were a sitting commanding officer, how would that impact upon your uh, ability to discharge your function? Anyone have a different opinion on that? Well, I don't know if the opinion is a different opinion, but I can tell you within the Naval Medical Research and Development Command, we do uh, permit our commanding officers 
to form uh, MOUs and MOAs with the commanding officers of other uh, organizations. Uh, so it's not a requirement that a given commanding officer approve the, the, uh, the recommendations of his own IRB. He, he just, uh, he, he can accept the uh, recommendations of another IRB through this uh, memorandum of understanding. And this is in, it, this is in effect now. I wanted to make a comment also. The university has a very similar system to that. Uh, that is, we're uh, unique in that uh, we have a number of affiliate institutions where our students train in their last two years. Uh, so that the university faculty extends well beyond the walls of, of this institution and so uh, extend into those affiliate institutions and hospitals, MTFs. Uh, because they are still our faculty and so that we still have uh, responsibility, uh, all of our faculty in the, in the research that they serve as PIs must be reviewed by our, our institutional review board. Uh, for those uh, studies that will be conducted at an affiliate institution, and that is one that uh, there is a, an agreement uh, between the president of the university and the Surgeon General for that service uh, that has charge over that particular MTF. Uh, we have what is known within the instruction, our 3201 instruction for the university, what is called a concurrence review, where the IRB chair has the uh, responsibility and privilege of looking over that particular study uh, if in his opinion or her opinion, depending on who the chair is that particular year, uh, if, if that study uh, looks reasonable in terms of, of the IRB review done locally, then the chair can choose to concur. Uh, but he or she also has the uh, ability to bring it to full review by the USIS IRB. So that's an, another way of, of, uh, of handling this situation. One other uh, option that hasn't been mentioned yet is uh, related to assurances. If you have a facility or, a, or hospitals with a smaller hospital, we have one base where we have a medical research and material command laboratory. And on the same base, we have an army material command development laboratory where they use one IRB and in the assurance process which under the common federal rule no institution is supposed to conduct human research with federal funds unless they have an assurance at that research institution you can issue an assurance where that commander signs and accepts uh, the coordination and the use of a different IRB or the IRB at another institution, or at that case, our Eucerium IRB acts for both commands. Um, however, the commander of the R&D laboratory with Army Materiel Command has his command authority. He can, he can disapprove a protocol that may have been approved by the Eucerium committee. And of course, the Eucerium commander is then the normal commander with his or her own IRB. So that's another option that um, sometimes within our hospitals, we have a lower hospital, so we use the IRB at the major medical center that covers that region. In that arena, I would remind those facilities that they should have an assurance for those smaller hospitals. If that is truly going to be a research site with an investigator and they're going to be conducting research there, they should have some type of an assurance document identifying where the IRB is located if they don't have their own IRB. Yes, go ahead. I think what you're talking about is a, 
expedited review process whereby if a, a study had been determined by one institution's IRB, one service's uh, local IRB to entail no more than minimal risk, could that in fact then be given expedited review status by another service? I, from my perspective, I certainly see no reason why not. I know of nowhere in our internal regulations, certainly not in the common rule, is that expressly prohibited. Each institution would still have to do expedited review in that case, and whether or not, uh, at, le at least at this point, without some type of, a, of, a, of a, a new agreement between the services, it would still require uh, whichever service you went to, you'd have to meet their, uh, their particular paperwork requirements. During the first couple of years of the Defense Women's Health Research Program, we found ourselves reviewing protocols which had come out of uh, Tulane University, University of Cincinnati, the extramural sites that had uh, won awards under that program. And um, uh, in talking to the investigators, we found that they had been pretty well bounced around uh, in meeting the, the various uh, format uh, requirements the, imposed by the various services and a largely, uh, well I can't say largely, but in some cases the differences were trivial at best. They only had to do with how the thing looked, not at, not, they didn't have to do with what it said. So for purposes of headquarters review of protocols involving no more than minimal risk arising from the outside world, we adopted a, a position uh, where if the documents provided had the content that was required, that's what we looked for. Um, the format is really just a way to ensure that the stuff you need is in there, right? It's a set of boxes that if they are full, you can be reasonably certain that the regulatory requirements have been addressed. And uh, I think that, speaking just for myself now, um, that administrative shorthand that lets us quickly look through something to make sure all the pieces are there has its place, but maybe we need to be somewhat less dogmatic about it, especially for proposals which cross uh, boundaries. Yes, sir, in the back. Philosophical comment based upon 
wanting to stay open in the business uh, for the longevity of uh, the service. And on that note, I think if there are no further questions, it's probably best that we adjourn. There is a reception, I understand. It's uh, down on the first, on the first level. Thank you very much.